as our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. This is a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 ton of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this show... Here you go, here it is, here it is. Woo! A flying whale that drives an aircraft manufacturer touches down. Impresses me still every day. Really good aircraft. And sends a trainee into a tailspin. It's okay, no? No? Like a stand Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely stressed too much. An American petrol head goes to extraordinary lengths. And it runs. To enter the world's oldest motoring event. I hope this isn't the bike path. This is a bike path, I think. <laughs> We're on a bike path. And in the USA, a global delivery service. Wow, it is really cool. Takes possession of a shiny new present. If it ain't a Boeing, it ain't going. <laughs> Worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Poking around a little bit. Mm. A leftover dessert. Hungry? <laughs> North Wales, the land of the dragon, is not averse to strange flying objects. But one in particular almost beggars belief. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a whale? Well, not quite, but it resembles a flying one. This is the Airbus Beluga, a mega transport plane able to air freight ridiculous loads. The Beluga is a very unique aircraft. Uh, there's only five of them in the world. The bulbous shape of the, the Beluga is purely because of the volume uh, that we need to carry. It sort of gives it its distinctive shape, which, um, which can look quite odd. It still generates interest. We get people stopping in cars at the end of the runway, uh, taking photos. It still intrigues the, the public. Today, at Hawarden Airport, this bizarre-looking beast, rather disappointingly called number two, will embark on a form of aviation cannibalism. Swallowing a batch of passenger aircraft wing parts for transport to another factory in France. This Beluga, it's a seven day operation. We work three, six, five, seven days a year. It impresses me still every day. It's really, really good. Really good aircraft. Naturally, a monster craft requires a massive and complex loading process. And when your plane's worth nigh on 200 million euros, you can't afford a prang. So, no pressure then for dispatch operator Paul. And we've got to stop them on that very, very small point just on the floor there to enable us then to start the offload for the aircraft. It's got to be perfect every time. If the Beluga doesn't hit the spot, 
none of the docking and unloading equipment will align correctly. But achieving pinpoint accuracy unbelievably relies on the most basic of tools, a stripey pole. I'll put the pole in as an indication of where I need to stop the aircraft. Take it to side five one, please, Dave. Straighten it up, mate. Back to 102 if you can. I'll be in constant communication with the tow ballast sub driver. Okay, straight on that. Keep your line up for a second, mate. Spot on there, mate. I'll count him down usually from around eight foot. Seven foot. Straight up on that. Six foot. Six inches. And stop. OK, Dave. The team pride themselves on their lightning-fast cargo turnaround using state-of-the-art technology. That starts with the beluga saying, ah, as she opens up wide. So the thing about the Beluga, it makes it so unique, is the ability to load and unload without disconnecting any flight controls um, or moving the cockpit with flight crew preparing for the next flight. No special controls um, to be disconnected and reconnected, and that enables us to achieve our 80-minute turnaround target. Nose up, the speedy process is helped along with swish electric doors that hug the Beluga's great girth as she disgorges her innards. The door is uh, the contour of the Beluga. Huge benefits in terms of weather. Doing it outside like uh, we're used to, we were just restricted to a 25 knot gust of wind, so uh, delay is very minimal. But on this occasion, the swish doors have lost their swish. It's the same fault. But for some reason, we've got a few little TV problems with the door. The door keeps stripping out for some unknown reason at the moment. That's the frustrating thing with it, really. We, we, ne we never really have any problems with it at all. The last couple of operations, it's been playing up. It's critical that we get it done on time, so hopefully there'll be no, no delay. Yeah, we're going for a push. In the end, it takes a helping hand to close the stubborn doors. All together, heave! After that untimely delay, the pressure is now on Paul to hit the Beluga's 80-minute turnaround. We'll commence the offload. We've got a strict time scale to the day or two, so every minute counts. Inside the offload container is a batch of covers, the carbon fibre skin for wings the Welsh factory manufactures. And in terms of communication, Mario is operating the Beluga itself and Terry's on the cargo border. We've both got to make sure they're aligned and they've both got to communicate at all times. If we've got a failure on the rollers, it's Eddie and Mario are in communication, it could cause damage. Once the wing covers are offloaded, the 100-tonne cargo border, effectively a super-sized winch, prepares the load of an empty jig container to be sent on to Europe. Before it goes on board, Paul gives the Beluga cargo deck a thorough check over. I love my job. At first, it was really intimidating um, coming to work with the aircraft. Uh, but after 16 years, um, I get huge job satisfaction seeing the aircraft depart after we've completed a su successful loading operation. I don't think there's an aircraft in the world that can have a view that I've got today. Really unique. Finally, the load container is scrutinised from every angle. Mario now is doing his pre-checks uh, of the load going onto the aircraft. It's a really critical part of the process. The aircraft has been configured to take this load in terms of weight, balance, centre of gravity. So it, it, it's really critical that we check and double-check everything that's coming on and off the aircraft. This is the whole shipment going in, and this is it, really. It's, it's quite straightforward, it's one-on-one-off. 
we're doing okay. We're doing really well on time. If anything, we're gonna be early. Fingers crossed. Remarkably, just one hour after touchdown, the beluga flying whale oh God. Oh God. leaves Wales as it heads to another factory in Europe. We've just completed the complete turn round the Tango Bravo. Done it successfully. We had a, a minor hitch with the door. It was fixed in a matter of minutes and um, we achieved it in 63 minutes, which again is, is really good. Really, really good uh, turnaround time. It still amazes me to this day after 16 years uh, watching it take off. Um, how it gets up in the air, I don't know. It's really satisfying seeing it leave when it does. Here we go. successful operation. Oh yes, definitely. But the fun and games aren't over. As they call in beluga number three, Mario waits anxiously. He's about to take his final loadmaster exam. Uh, a little bit nervous, I suppose, but uh, I'm pretty confident about what I'm doing. To ramp up the pressure, he must successfully oversee the load of a gigantic wing for the A350 long distance passenger jet. The big question is, will Super Mario rise to the challenge? 105, 105. 105.5. It's OK, no? No? You understand, Mario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayfair, London. The stomping ground for the fabulously rich. It's also the temporary residence for American Bob McEwen. I love my car. I am a caretaker of history. Bob's also not short of a buck or two and has forked out thousands to air freight his beloved 1903 Packard car all the way from the good old USA. This is one of my favorite cars. I bought the 1903 Packard in 2001 and it was a pile of pieces that came out of an auction in Denver, Colorado, which is where it was sold new by Packard. It took me five years to restore the car to where you see it now. Bob's flown his car thousands of miles to take part in the annual London to Brighton Veterans Run. Apparently the world's longest running motoring event, but definitely the slowest. Hordes of antiquated automobiles, some steam-driven, gasp and splutter their way 60 miles to the South Coast Seaside Resort. With a fair wind and steep hill, some even hit eye-watering speeds of 20 miles per hour. You know, we all know one another. Oh, nice to see you again. Oh, how's your car going? Oh, it broke down. It's great. In 1904, the speed limit in England was raised from 8 miles an hour to 12 miles an hour. And so the Brighton run was started to commemorate that. So it was for 1904 and earlier cars. And they get about 500 every year to do the run. In 2006 was the first time I did the Brighton run in this car. And uh, we've done it eight times since then. We'll end up in Brighton at 3.30 or so um, and have a drink at, on the shore in Brighton and then the car reverses the procedure to come home. Rewind five days and Bob's car is on the journey of its 115-year-old life as it jets across the Atlantic bound for the tiny European country, Luxembourg. At the airport, the crushing responsibility of taking care of one of the first cars ever manufactured falls squarely on the shoulders of product manager, Christian Thies. Today we are expecting the arrival of a very valuable car uh, arriving from uh, New York. Very rarely do we have such an old and valuable car on board one of our aircraft. 
Transporting a car requires a lot of expertise. We have dedicated teams and uh, every cargo is treated with care. But obviously, I mean, such a car, which is irreplaceable, special attention is also given to it. As the Boeing 747-8 freighter, bearing Bob's car in its 30,000 cubic feet belly, draws to a halt, the ground crew spring into action. So the freighter has landed and everything is getting prepared to offload the complete aircraft, where we have about 120 tons loaded on um, 42 aircraft pallets. That's a side door where we are able to offload cargo, which is, uh, we can go up to three meters high. And on the front, uh, there we can offload pieces which are much longer. Here is the famous car coming directly from New York into Luxembourg. It made all the way over the, the Atlantic, and here it is. Proudly standing among the packing crates is a priceless piece of rolling history. The Ford Packard is only the second car to successfully drive coast to coast across America. So the ground crew better handle her with due deference. One false move could dent the immaculate Packard's bodywork and their cargo handling reputation. The condition has to be uh, good, check that everything is all right and uh, that the customer are happy with it, of course. But as the critical moment arrives, classic car nut Christian is completely distracted, lost under the Packard's bewitching spell. Let me also take a picture. <laughs> are you a car fan? Yes, I am. Yes, I have an MGB from 1974. Yes, it has actually the same color as well. <laughs> Looks like it's brand new. <laughs> so this will move backwards and then will be turned and then taken out on the side cargo door. Our loading system inside of the aircraft is uh, fully automated. So we only need actually one, maximum two people to have the 747 offloaded completely. And this can be done within an hour. Yes, Cargo Lux's cunning plan to eradicate human error is to use as few humans as possible. Instead, a variety of high-tech machines whisk the Ford Packard off the 747 freighter. So right now the car will be transported via a pallet transporter to avoid any big shocks. Now the Packard 1903 has been offloaded almost 20 minutes after arrival of the aircraft. Of course, when the car reaches the warehouse, there's not a human in sight. The Packard is assigned its stacking bay via computer. Now the car has entered in the stacker system where the pallet together with the car will be stored. The stacker system, as you can see, is fully automated. There is no people inside, so also nobody can touch the car. And of course, the last part of the journey will take place uh, soon. Uh, and this will be done by truck from uh, Luxembourg into London. And uh, we all hope that the car will arrive safe into London. The final leg of the Packard's epic journey will be a 300-mile road trip by truck before it can be safely reunited with doting owner, Bob. It's fabulous. Looks like it's ready to go. But being in the hands of its Cavalier owner means the Packard's danger is far from over. Oh, I forgot. Jeez. <laughs> I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Louisville, home to UPS's Worldport. The planet's largest automated package handling facility brings fresh meaning to special delivery. With an ability to sort 416,000 items per hour, then deliver them to over 220 countries. Everything going good tonight so far? Yeah, we're good. And on a chilly November evening, Christmas has come early. What's happening tonight, we're getting a brand new Boeing 747-8 arriving here in about an hour. This is cool, just about anybody who works for an airline has maybe just a little bit of jet fuel in their blood, and so to see something like this, you know, brand new from the factory, it's just really neat. 
So we've got a flight tracking app and we can actually watch the flight coming in. It is 5X9109 and right now it is just north of St. Louis and coming in on a nice straight line here into Louisville. Excitement is building. The aircraft is en route from Boeing's factory in Everett, Washington, but media head Jim faces a quandary. I'd say probably here, maybe right there. I don't know if it's going to be this way. He must find the correct touchdown location in the 5.2 million square foot airport. Well, they told us that the plane would be landing this way, not that way. And this, air, this aircraft coming in yeah, is obviously that way. We're going to call it and see. Hey, Tony, yeah, I wanted to check back and see if you had an update on flight 9109, uh, what runway it'll be on, and which direction it'll be landing. OK, right at 7. Thank you, I appreciate it. OK, have a good night. OK, landing on this runway, they said the landing time is right about 7, 7 p.m. And it's about 5 to 7, so we need to get going. Where exactly is it going to pull in? Right in here. Okay, so where's the nose wheel go? The nose wheel's right here. Right, right by the chocks? Yep. Right okay. Right here. Yeah. All right, cool. Almost here. A couple of minutes. Bang on schedule. The ginormous jumbo makes her final approach. Here you go. Here it is. Here it is. Woo! Oh. And there it is. N613 UP. 7478 Pride of the Fleet. All right, so there it is right there. You can see it coming off the runway. It'll taxi in here and end up right here by these wheel chocks. She's, she's home. That's what we'll say, she's home. As the 747-8 slowly taxis into her new abode, she's given the full reverential welcome. Wow. They don't call her the queen of the skies for nothing. So pretty soon this marshaller will take control the captain on board and the marshal are communicating even though they're not talking to each other. It's all based upon the, the positions of the wands. Finally, this massive, shapely bird glides to a halt. That signal says that the wheel chocks are in and they can release the parking brake. And her pulling power is shocking, even to Jim. Didn't know this was gonna happen, but we have a lot of people here to meet the airplane, about 50. We've got buses and vans of people to go take a look at the new airplane. It's just awesome. This fresh out of the factory jumbo jet has lots of added jumbo. The 747-8 is over 18 feet longer than the previous generation 747. Can hump 24 tons more load, fly 1,000 nautical miles further, and is more fuel efficient and quieter. Adding up to an even greater thrill for the expectant throng. <laughs> 10 people won a competition to go get a tour of a 747-8, and they each get to bring about three or four people with them. So we're gonna go up and take them and show them the aircraft, have a good time. I love to see this. I mean, this just shows the enthusiasm that people have for an iconic airplane like this, the 747-8. It is pretty big. Everything's new right. and shiny and beautiful. It takes a lot to bring people out here on airport property, but it's certainly worthwhile to, to let people, you know, have a look at the, at the girl, at the queen. Yes, this truly is a rare treat. Here you can see the wing. Normally, the 747-8 will be stuffed full of containers, but for tonight only, these privileged few can gawp at the Queen in her naked form. It's, it's really cool. It's really, really big, too. I'm just blown away from it. I'm speechless. It's cool. <laughs> Go ahead and flush. Hit the flush. Go ahead. Oh, wow. It's a suction. Like, you've been checked out on your first piece of equipment in 747. It's the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really awesome. It's humongous. And if it ain't a Boeing, it ain't going. <laughs> but sadly, this lot do have to get going. The party is over. But as we'll see, Jim gets to enjoy this flying beauty all by himself. 
It's a full-size bed. It's about six feet. It's actually, I've, I've slept on it, and it's, it's comfortable. In Mayfair, London, Bob McEwen is about to rendezvous with his ancient 1903 Ford Packard car. The American forked out big bucks to air freight it from the United States. And now it's approaching the end of a 4,000 mile journey. Hi, Bob McEwen. Hi, Bob. Shane from Bespoke. Nice, nice to meet, meet you. you. Hi. You picked this I up? I picked it up from yesterday. Heathrow. Yesterday from Heathrow for you. So, so we're ready to go. Ready to go. Just got to unstrap it, and she's all yours. Perfect. We're, do we're, we're good. good. We're doing it. We're good. Thanks. Bob last saw his car a week ago, and now he's beside himself with nervous anticipation. It's fabulous. I'm glad it made it. Wheels aren't broken, nothing's wrong. Looks like it's ready to go. Three of my friends' cars ended up in Antwerp instead of here, and they'll miss the run this year. But not this one, it made it. We even cleaned it for you, Bob. Thank you. We gave it a quick polish for you. I was gonna say, I didn't think it got dirty in the airline. <laughs> Do you want me to just get it in and back minute. it off? I'll ask you to steer it in a minute. Okay. Sitting in and steer it, but I will control it on the winch. So it's a controlled descent. Bob, yeah. if you'd like to come up and take pride of place in your car. Like an old friend made it. Right. You're good to go. So far, the Packard has made it transatlantic without a scratch. Bob, left hand down. No, the other way. Other way. Now Bob must sort out his left from right, or the last few feet could all go horribly wrong. Straighten out. All right, stop there. There you go. Bob, can you turn the back of the car that way for me, please? That's as far as you get. That's fine. We're good. Jane, looks fabulous. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hopefully we can work with you in the future. Absolutely. Take care. Bob's gone to incredible trouble and expense just to fly his Packard over for the veteran car run, an annual jaunt for near prehistoric motors Fut-futting from London to the south coast town, Brighton. And sometimes you drop things. All I needed to do was hook up the battery here, which is plus and minus. As it's only four days away, Bob gives his Packard the once over to check everything's in full working order. I'm gonna check and see how much gas is in the tank. There's no gas. Eight gallons of gas, it's all gone. <laughs> Leaks, everything. Definitely incontinent. <laughs> Uh-oh. No gas means Bob must traipse the foreign streets of London in search of a petrol station. 30 minutes aimlessly wandering later, he strikes oil. Hallelujah! Well, we put gas in it. We've got the fuel turned on. There we go. Hey, hallelujah. Starting the Packard is a challenge in itself. There are no keys or, God forbid, electronic ignition. So the only way to crank the 115-year-old single-cylinder engine into life is by brute force. And it runs. Recklessly throwing caution aside, Bob roars, or rather splutters off taking his friend for a test drive. A scary one at that, as Crazy Bob turns it into his own wacky races. Oh, I forgot. Jeez. <laughs> I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> With up to 50 accidents a day in central London alone, it's like throwing a priceless antique into a demolition derby. Don't hit the nice taxi cab. There's the London Eye. I hope this isn't the bike path. This is a bike path, I think. <laughs> We're on a bike path. London traffic is definitely interesting and definitely a pain. 
and this car doesn't have enough acceleration, but I feel so lucky to be able to ride around and enjoy the city. And how many people can say they've driven an old car around London? And everybody smiles at you. <laughs> Thank you. This car's running terrific. We got a little bit of gas in her, and she's happy, and she's happy to run around. Perfect for London. So, despite a couple of near misses, Bob's Packard survives the London gauntlet unscathed. Next is the big one, the veteran car run. Hey, Mitch! Go, Wendy! But little does Bob know, there would be a savage twist to his motoring fairy tale. Back at Hawarden Airport, North Wales, the Beluga deliveries are coming in thick and fast, with aircraft number three touching down. The Beluga that's arrived is uh, taking a right-hand A350 wing. It's a big wing. On its own weighs about 21 tonne as well. So it's a pretty hefty wing that we're sending today. These giant air freighters make daily shuttles around Europe, delivering plane parts for Airbus. But this next job is anything but normal for trainee loadmaster Mario. So today um, I'm going to be doing my loadmaster test, so just see how it goes. Uh, so hopefully it all goes well. I'll be testing today on the communication skills with the crew of the aircraft. I'll be tested on offloading the plane, loading the plane safely. Passing this test today, it can be big. There's, there's like exciting opportunities to, to fly around Europe on the Beluga. So yeah, it means, it means a big deal to me, yeah. Shadowing Mario is Jean-Yves Berry, or Chuck Berry, as the beluga wags like to call him. He's a man who loves to bring a dollop of Gallic flair to the party. My job today is to release Mr. Mario Merolo, Lord Master. Mario's test begins as the giant beluga nose is peeled open, ready for the cargo offload. Now you can release the button. After one meter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 After uh, now, the temperature. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mario has his work cut out, because next he must figure mental arithmetic that would give Pythagoras a run for his money. One to five point five, OK. One to five, one to five. One to five point five. We can't import point five. On it's a not computer? possible, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. OK. It's OK, no? No? You understand, Mario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He must instantly calculate the beluga's angle, center of gravity and weight, including estimated fuel, so the jack operator can perfectly level the aircraft, ready for loading. It's okay? So it's only one ton. Yeah, yeah. It's good for you. Everything OK? Yeah. Let's go, Mario. Calc's done. Now it's the moment of truth, where the Mario sums add up. I'm stressed out here. I'm absolutely stressed to the max. Yes, Jack, 88, 87. Perfect. Perfect. So far, so good for Mario, for me. He's done one of the main bits, which is the jack configuration. Really important that that is right. Mario, on that turn, did very well. Not one mistake. <laughs> OK, happy days. With a resounding tick on his speed maths test, Mario sends out the cargo crate to collect a wing for the huge A350 passenger jet. Spanning around four London buses long, it promises a tight squeeze. I'll have a little walk around now, uh, making sure it's in the right orientation, the right number, make sure nothing's loose before it goes onto the aircraft, as I'm the last link in the chain, as I say. So it is quite a lot of pressure. I'll just have a little walk yeah. around and then we'll wait. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. Direction is okay. Yeah. MSN. MSN. Two, two three, three, four. four. Okay. Correct, yeah. Wing, we have... right. Okay. Yeah, Wing. It's... Not left, huh? Right. Correct. <laughs> Make sure we've got the right Very one. important, okay? Yeah. We don't want to send the wrong wing over. It's okay for you, Mario. Okay. All right, let's go. So far, Mario hasn't put a foot wrong. But inside the beluga, there may be hidden hazards that could trip him up. 
So yeah, we just have a bit of a general walk around of the hold, just to make sure nothing's falling off onto the rails for when we for when we load the plane. So it's just a, a visual check. <laughs> it's important uh, oil, oil leak, you know, because it's very toxic. Yeah, erosion, corrode. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Ah, there is. Yeah, feel yeah. there. And very slight burry. Which we just spotted a small, small hydraulic leak, which can be quite dangerous for the aircraft because of the corrosion. We need to call a maintenance up just to give it a bit of a clean up. Otherwise, it could get, could get a lot worse. As it stands, Mario's doing a really good job under the pressure, uh, and there is pressure today. We've managed to get the aircraft docked. We've completed the offload, and now we're just about to complete the load. He's doing really well. With the oil leak scrubbed up, Mario gives the all clear to start ingesting the massive A350 wing into the beluga's belly. It's going well so far, yeah. Uh, I'm happy, to, uh, Johnny is happy. So, yeah, it's the final stages now, then this will be loaded. The A350 wing stretches to over 100 feet and weighs 25 tons. It seems impossibly big, but the beluga swallows it in one gulp. I've made it. Good job. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Everything went well. Yeah, happy. Exciting times ahead. But just as Mario can taste the glory of qualified loadmaster, the wheels come off. Or rather, a printer malfunctions. We have a problem with the printer. Ah, yeah. What's wrong with the computers? Paperwork is an essential part of the Bluger operation. The printer has malfunctions. We need that paperwork to come off as we've got another aircraft inbound. It's critical to avoid any delays on Tango Delta, which is coming in. So I need the printer working uh, sooner rather than later. Fortunately, the rogue printer is quickly fixed. The Beluga is rubber stamped and sent on her way. As for Mario, one can only say he came through his Loadmaster examination with flying colours. A great day for Mario. Great day, champagne. <laughs> okay. All's gone well. So, yeah, I'm all passed off now. So any aircraft that come in from now on, there'll be no trainer. It'll just be me on my own. Very happy, yeah. Earlier, we saw how, with great fanfare, Worldport welcomed their latest, largest, and swankiest cargo plane. Oh, here it is, here it is. Woo! A 747-8 to their home at Louisville. Wow. They don't call her the queen of the skies for nothing. A select crowd were given a privileged peek. I think it's really awesome. It's humongous. I'm just blown away from it. I'm speechless. It's cool. <laughs> but now the party's over. That's all except for media man, Jim, who can't resist sneaking a peek at the Queen of the Skies private parts. There we go. So we're on the upper deck of the 7478. Most people don't get a chance to see what the inside of a freighter looks like. Um, this is the area for what we would call jump seaters. So they might be pilots who are moving from place to place. These are first class uh, passenger seats, so you've got six back here. You've actually got a couple of more seats up front in the cockpit, but you know, this plane might fly 12, 13 hours, and you have people you know, on board for that, so we want to make them comfortable. Here in the back, come take a look. There's actually two full size bunks, so while two people fly, two people can rest. There's one bunk here, there's one over on the other side, and it's a full size bed, it's about six feet. It's actually, I've, I've slept on it, and it's, it's comfortable. But there's no rest for the 747-8, as she can cruise almost 5,000 miles on a full stomach of 139 tons and keep her crew well fed too. On long flights, you know, you want to eat. And so there's a galley, hot water, and then coffee, and then lots of storage. Take a look. So in here is a convection oven. Uh, they'll put essentially frozen meals on here, nice frozen meals that you heat up. Uh, might be fish, might be chicken, might be beef tips. 
25, 35 minutes at about 350 degrees, and uh, you get a nice meal back at your seat. So I was poking around a little bit. And we should have a, a leftover dessert. Hungry? <laughs> of course, the ultimate in a sanctum is the cockpit. Come on and sit down, take a look. Here, you can deliver a spine-tingling 1,184 kilonewtons of thrust to reach Mach 0.845 speed, 560 miles per hour for us mortals. I'm sitting in the captain's seat. I'm by no means a captain, uh, but I can explain a few of what you might see here. Um, four engines, so you've got four throttles. This is the flight management computer. Uh, they program the route the airplane will fly, and really shortly after takeoff, they engage the autopilot, and then the flight management computer flies the airplane almost to the destination where the crew then takes over and does the landing. Fuel control for the engines. Here's the yoke, uh, which is you know what you use to control the aircraft. You pull back to go up, push forward to go down, turn left and right with the ailerons. Up here are further controls, uh, including uh, fuel, uh, the what we call air conditioning packs, basically air conditioning for climate control. These are actually uh, fire control levers. And then the rest of the cockpit is really just circuit breakers. You sit up here and, and you realize how skilled the pilots really are to operate you know, a, a machine that's as massive as this one is. I'm proud of this airplane. We've got it now in the fleet. We'll eventually have 28 of these. Having been given the royal treatment tonight, the 747-8 will soon come down to Earth, hopefully without a major bump. She'll revert to being a giant workhorse of the skies, delivering packages to you and me. It is really cool. I mean, it's just... As you folks in the UK, I think, say it, uh, it's a fine piece of kit. In Hyde Park, central London, it's the day of the veteran car run. Around 400 historic 100-plus-year-old automobiles and some almost equally ancient owners cough and splutter as they warm up for the big one, a 60-mile amble to Brighton on the south coast. This is the most famous old event car in the world, the London to Brighton. There is nothing else like it in the world. It's great. I just like the pageantry and the drama. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, usually, I mean, we've even got the best weather today. Usually it's pouring rain and uh, your biggest risk is catching pneumonia. Six minutes before the first car will be crossing the start line. Tradition demands the race starts by the tearing of the flag. And with the flag torn, the intrepid owners tear off. Well, in a manner of speaking. Hey, Mitch! Go, Wendy! It's all systems go, apart from one hapless individual. Our man from the USA, Bob, is on the sidelines, reduced to the role of spectator. Friday morning, we were driving the car around London, and for some reason, the connecting rod bearing failed. Would have dramatically hurt the car if we kept going. We've done major effort to get the car here, so it's extremely disappointing. We just can't describe it. Probably spent $15,000 to get the car here. It's just horrible. So, as the veteran cars merrily wheeze their way south to Brighton, Bob's Packard heads in the opposite direction for shipping back home to America. Not that this whole sorry affair has put the brakes on Bob. I love my car. We'll take it apart and fix it, and it'll be back running again. We'll be back next year, for sure. We're gonna have a good time again. Next time, there's more crazy cargo, more fabulous freighters, 
and more demanding deadlines to hit. As Mega Air cranks it up to the max.